I first want to thank the Teachers Institute for Evolutionary Science for sponsoring this webinar and Verta Vasquez for organizing it. I'm grateful to each of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be part of this webinar and to make the best use of our time. I've pre-recorded the presentation and I've reserved some time at the end for questions. I'm excited about this event because it's the first opportunity to tell the backstory behind my new book and to summarize some of the main ideas. The title of the book is Rethinking Evolution, but the subtitle, The Revolution That's Hiding in Plain Sight, is also important. We're in the midst of a revolution in evolutionary science that has truly been hiding in plain sight, and we owe it to our students and to the general public to update the narrative. And it's important for us scientists and teachers to remember what George Munbayat stated so elegantly in the context of politics, but that also applies to evolutionary science and many other topics. He said that the reason we need a narrative is that narratives translate into what we perceive as common sense. People look for sense in the world. That's not the sense provided by facts and figures, or the sense provided by politics. It's provided by stories. We're creatures of narrative. We're innately predisposed to hear stories. There are very good evolutionary reasons for this. Humans have navigated the ecology in which we were immersed through understanding and that understanding was transmitted by means of stories. So what's wrong with the standard textbook narrative about evolutionary science? In a nutshell, Darwin's brilliant insight of natural selection was a very high-level description that focused on the origins of species. That was fine for the 19th century, but biology has advanced by leaps and bounds, especially in recent years, and now we're able to ask and answer a much deeper question, which is, what are the natural forces that give rise not just to diverse species, but to biological complexity? Now, a while back, I posted an open letter on LinkedIn to NSF, the NIH, and to college administrators. And my point was that we really need to do a better job of communicating science in general and biology and evolution in particular to the general public. And we can do this by training fewer specialists and more generalists by putting more resources into training science communicators who reach out to the general public. One point that I made was that what matters for solving global problems and for global prosperity is that people understand the big picture. The minutia of science are fine in certain contexts, but there is little reward and even less funding offered to scientific pioneers who spend at least as much time asking the right questions as they do answering them. Well, in my own career path, I wanted to be one of those generalists. But my PhD advisors told me I needed to focus on specialized research and publish lots of papers and forget about that theoretical nonsense. Well, I did publish some useful specialized papers, but it's only been quite recently that I've had the freedom to return to asking about the big picture. And what started out as a couple of posts on LinkedIn ended up expanding into a full-blown, comprehensive discussion of evolutionary science. This began about two years ago, when I read a really interesting paper, including a popular version of it, about a new perspective on quantum physics. According to the authors, Ruth Kastner, Stuart Kaufman, and Michael Epperson, it may be possible to resolve some of the paradoxes in quantum physics with a conceptual shift where we include the potential event for events to occur as part of how we define reality. And that started me thinking more broadly about the potential for new innovations to occur in evolution as well. And to make a long story short, I realized that the potential for new innovations in biology is constantly changing because each new innovation creates the opportunity for higher level innovations to take place and for new innovations to emerge. Well, I posted some of those ideas on LinkedIn, and Ruth Kastner said I really should write a book about it. And she recommended me to a publisher, World Scientific, and that led to a project that ended up taking an entire year. But in retrospect, I really think it was worth it, because I was able to describe a much more comprehensive explanation than the textbook explanation that we've been using for evolution. And it's based entirely on literally thousands of empirical observations and experiments by other scientists that have been published in peer-reviewed journals 
and that are thoroughly supported by the empirical evidence. So what are some of the main features of what I'm calling the updated evolutionary synthesis? We can certainly begin by recognizing that there's more to natural selection than the gradual accumulation of incremental random mutations. Part of the problem lies with the so-called modern synthesis from the 1940s, which takes its unfortunate name from the title of Julian Huxley's popular book. The name is unfortunate because at some point in time, of course, any modern synthesis will no longer be modern. And that's the case now. With his 1953 popular book, Evolution in Action, Huxley stated what has unfortunately become the textbook narrative that we still teach today in middle school and high school. Huxley wrote that mutation merely provides the raw material of evolution. It is a random affair and takes place in all directions. The effects of mutations are not related to the needs of the organism or the conditions in which it is placed. And in 1988, John Maynard Smith had this to say about variation that arises from recombination. All that recombination can do is produce a more random distribution from a less random one. Well, today we know that there are a variety of ways that DNA sequences can change, and many of those changes involve duplication, modification, and reuse of modules that have already proven to be of general use in the past, and that retain many of those useful characteristics when they are modified and reused in new ecological contexts. Not only that, but those duplicated modules can interact to give rise to new innovations at higher levels of complexity. The potential for new innovations has changed because the previous innovations have created new opportunities and laid the groundwork for higher levels of organization to arise when those modules interact in new ways. But let's consider some concrete, real-life examples. In the late 1960s and 1970, Susumu Ono described an extremely important way that DNA sequences can change, and those changes have several non-random aspects. Gene duplication is an important example of the non-random ways that modular subunits, in this case proteins and the regulatory DNA sequences that control their expression, can arise. And once they've been duplicated, duplicated genes can be modified and fine-tuned by more classical incremental accumulation of mutations, even random ones. And then they take on new functions while retaining some or all of the useful characteristics that they already had. Most of the genes in the human genome, and in most other multicellular organisms for that matter, are members of multi-gene families that arose by gene duplication. The modern synthesis and the concept of random incremental changes as the sole raw material of evolution really doesn't describe gene duplication, even though it's certainly true that incremental random mutations may very well be involved in fine-tuning that and in the genes acquiring new functions. They're not mutually exclusive. These are synergistic ways that the genome can change. Gene duplication events are not incremental either and the genome itself has evolved mechanisms that can increase the probabilities of particular gene duplication events. Repetitive DNA sequences, especially simple repeats, are hot spots for unequal recombination events that give rise to gene duplication events. And um, as a graduate student, I described a fundamental mechanism, slipped strand mispairing, that is responsible for most of the repetitive sequences that are dominant features of the genomes of uh, most multicellular organisms. So these are, these are um, mechanisms that accelerate um, uh, evolutionary change and make gene duplication and other kinds of uh, changes more likely than they otherwise would be. And why not make mechanisms like slip strand mispairing come alive for the students in the classroom by taking advantage of digital media and animation and techniques like those pioneered by Drew Berry, which you can see in the following clip. It turns out that slip strand mispairing also has medical importance because it's the mechanism that 
leads to trinucleotide repeats that cause a number of different um, human diseases. This yellow portion is the portion where the trinucleotide repeat is. And as you know, helicases open the DNA and DNA polymerases copy it. So we're going to watch the repeat now, get through the helicase, this single strand is it shown. And the DNA polymerase slips on that repeat and a hairpin is formed. And as this now go through, you will watch as we'll, as we'll go through the second cycle, next round of replication. This longer repeat will now get replicated and incorporated in our DNA. And you're going to end up with an expansion. And here you've seen a small expansion, but imagine this going on again and again and again. So with time, this will continue to get bigger, and that's why the disease will keep getting worse. Getting back to gene duplication, most genes arise by means of gene duplication, and these duplicated genes often become members of multi-gene families that are modified by incremental mutations in a more classical way and take on a variety of functions. But that's not all. They also lay the groundwork for new innovations at higher levels of complexity to arise. These are fascinating topics to explore in the classroom. The sense of smell, for example, depends on large families of receptor proteins that arose by gene duplication and that vary such that particular odor receptors can bind to particular molecules characteristic of certain scents. Then these binding events are transduced into electrical signals and together the signals from many hundreds of distinct odor receptors are transmitted to the brain where they are assembled in a way that um, allows animals to distinguish odors. There are lots of interesting stories to tell about this, such as the fact that dogs have evolved a much better sense of smell than humans because natural selection has retained a much larger family of functional odor receptor proteins. And even over much shorter time spans, humans have artificially selected breeds, such as bloodhounds, that have incredible abilities to distinguish different scents. These are the subject of lots of documentary films and clips that can be found on YouTube, and these sorts of media can create a captivating classroom experience that students will understand and remember. Another example where duplicated and subsequently mutated and selected genes take on higher level functions is in the immune system. And this is another very relevant aspect of evolution. It's closely linked to human survival as well. And an understanding of vaccination and fighting the threat of emergent diseases and the evolution of resistant pathogens, all of these kinds of topics are important reasons for students to understand evolutionary principles. So the immune system is a great place to start. So only recently have we discovered the powerful mechanisms such as gene duplication that accelerate evolutionary change. There's more to natural selection than accumulation of incremental random mutations. When they prove useful in the struggle for existence, the more complex innovations tend to be preserved. Each evolutionary innovation lays the groundwork for more complex innovations to arise. I refer to this as Emergent Evolutionary Potential, or EEP for short. During the life of each individual, the potential for real-time molecular and cellular interactions is set up during the process of development. Development of the embryo and development during other parts of the life history of the organism. This gets into the whole subject of evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO, which has shed quite a bit of light on um, evolution and goes far beyond what Darwin could possibly have, um, have talked about, because none of this was known back then. Sean Carroll's Endless Forms Most Beautiful is an excellent popular book that describes some of the major findings of this important new um, line of research. So he talks about modular toolkits 
um, and um, that these are reusable modules, as I've, as I've mentioned in the context of gene duplication. Um, so I, I refer to the modular toolkits as the generative phenotype because these are reusable elements that are used during development in a variety of different ways. And so it's not actually the final phenotype of the individual because they're reusable and they transcend many generations. So to make that distinction, um, I've, I've uh, coined the term generative phenotype for toolkit elements that are reusable in various ways. And then the specific adaptations of the particular species that, that you see in the fully developed individual, that's the ecological phenotype. So what are some other examples of emergent evolutionary potential that might capture the interest and imagination of students? The fact that all of our own cells, our nucleated eukaryotic cells, have semi-autonomous power plants, metaphorically speaking, called mitochondria and chloroplasts, is due to the emergence of higher levels of structure and function when formerly separate cells bacterial cells and archaean cells literally came together and fused to form more complex cells and were then subsequently fine-tuned by natural selection. And while the fine-tuning might be viewed as gradual and incremental and somewhat random, the origins of eukaryotic cells in the first place can hardly be called gradual, random, or incremental. There's nothing incremental about it, and it's best described as previous innovations in the separate cells laying the groundwork for new innovations at higher levels of complexity to arise or emerge. So we need to expand our conceptual framework to include these new concepts, that natural selection in particular and other natural evolutionary forces in general are actually creating new opportunities, new possibilities, but that's not all. The probabilities of specific events taking place are being altered in a way that transcends both space and time. When these innovations are being stored as reusable modules in the genome. The genome is an incredibly powerful way to store reusable modules, and it can be seen as a repository for stored evolutionary potential that transcends generations. So we're no longer talking just about incremental random mutations and incremental changes that accumulate. We're talking about innovations that lay the groundwork for higher level innovations to arise with much higher probabilities than just random events. Now let's take a closer look at the role of development and evolutionary developmental biology, or EvoDevo. As I mentioned, another major aspect of the updated evolutionary synthesis is the new awareness and increasingly deep understanding of the role of development in reproducing the structures and functions of the individual in each generation and the cellular structures and patterns and adaptations that are characteristic of each species. There are a number of surprises about the ways that genetic information has evolved to determine the shape, form, capabilities, and patterns of individual species, not the least of which is that we find deep homology inherited common ancestry that includes a very broad range of different animals and even plants in the genes, including regulatory genes such as Hox genes that control the overall development of the body plan and segmentation of the organism. And we also find that the same genes are often used in species-specific ways that provide different solutions to the same sorts of ecological problems such as vision. So as John Carroll points out in his book, we can now think of the genetic elements that are reused in various ways, particularly during development, as modular toolkits. These toolkits, which I call the generative phenotype, have extraordinary organizing power. This makes the origins of biological complexity easier to imagine in detail and makes evolution by means of natural forces much more plausible than ever before. Where many people question whether the accumulation of selected random changes really has the necessary power to organize the incredibly complex and efficacious structures and functions of living things, these new perspectives of changing opportunities, emergence of higher level interactions, 
and modifiable reusable duplicated modules and toolkits is a whole new level of understanding of how this is in fact possible. Biology tells us a lot about how evolution works, and the two subjects should be closely related to each other in the classroom. Evolution should not be taught separately from the biology that explains it. Now, one of the major themes that teachers need to get across in the classroom is that the complex organization that has the appearance of design in natural history is actually not designed at all, but arises by powerful natural forces that have enormous organizing potential. Now, when we include the recent discoveries in biology, we see that all of these seeming miracles are possible because of the flow of energy and because of the physical and chemical properties of complex organic molecules such as proteins, DNA, and RNA. In many cases, we find that higher levels of structure and function emerge in evolutionary potential are actually mediated by shape-specific interactions, both physical and chemical, between the exquisite three-dimensional structures of these complex proteins that can be thought of as micro-machines. So I've included a descriptive name in the updated evolutionary synthesis for this that takes that into account and call it shape-specific molecular interactions and binding events, or SSM-IBE for short. Now I want to cover another general topic which is the origin of life. As with much of evolutionary science, the textbooks tend to lag behind discoveries at the cutting edge, and that's a real shame because these new conceptual insights are absolutely fascinating. There can be little doubt that the evolution of gen the genetic code greatly increased the organizing power of natural selection and accelerated the origins of species. But before there were any macromolecules such as RNA, DNA, or proteins, how did life begin in the first place? Well, the textbook explanation for this, which focuses on things like the Miller-Urey experiment uh, from the 1950s, is not very convincing, detailed, or complete, to say the least. What about the earliest stages of organic evolution on planet Earth? We now have a much more plausible explanation for the natural forces that transformed relatively simple compounds into more complex biochemical networks that eventually took on the characteristics that we associate with living organisms. Long story short, as beautifully described in Nick Lane's popular books, such as The Vital Question, starting with predictions made in the 1980s, followed by actual observations in the 21st century, there's good reason to believe that natural energy flow played a major role in the origin of life. We actually find natural proton gradients under the ocean at locations known as alkaline hydrothermal vents, and we also find mineral catalysts such as iron sulfide that could have uh, been involved in synthesizing complex organic compounds long before there was anything even resembling DNA or RNA. This is actually a more plausible, well-supported hypothesis than the uh, so-called primordial soup idea that arose with the Miller-Urey experiments. This is also a great opportunity to get students engaged and to um, encourage critical thinking uh, by looking at the evidence and the actual discoveries and observations and giving students a chance to uh, decide for themselves whether or not they think that these new ideas um, and hypotheses are uh, more substantial and better supported than the earlier ideas. Now I certainly hope that I haven't given the impression that there's no use for Darwin's classical theory of natural selection anymore. Uh, far from it. What I've shown, I think, is that these other ideas, emergent evolutionary potential, the generative phenotype, shape-specific molecular interactions, and so on, show that natural selection is far more powerful as an organizing force than it would be if it was just due to random mutations that gradually accumulated. So let's look at the value of examples from nature in 
getting the basic ideas of the classical Darwinian explanation across in the classroom in a way that kids will appreciate and understand and remember later on. So what are we looking at in this picture? Is this a snake? And how do you know? Well, snakes don't have legs, but if you look closely at this picture, you can see that it's using something that looks an awful lot like legs to cling from that green stem upside down. And in fact, it's a caterpillar. So why do these caterpillars look like snakes? And how did they get that way? They look like snakes because that scares off animals that might otherwise eat them. Which begs the question, well, how did they get that way? First, as described at a high level in Darwin's classical theory, they got that way because in each generation, and over many thousands of generations, there was some variation among the individual caterpillars, and some happened to look more like snakes than others. The individuals that looked more like snakes were more likely to scare away the animals that might eat them, so they were more likely to survive. And they would mate, and they would have more offspring that also look like them. But in the next generation, there would also be variation, and some of those individuals would look even more like snakes. They would do a better job of scaring off animals that might otherwise eat them, and they would survive better. They would uh, ha have more offspring that look like them. And so these differences would gradually accumulate. And over many, many generations, they would eventually end up looking like they look today, which is uh, very much like snakes. So this is what we call natural selection, and it's based on inherited differences between the offspring that accumulate. But there's a second question, which is, what exactly is that inherited information? And Darwin freely admitted that he had no idea what it is. And how does that inherited information get translated into the characteristics of the individual during development? Well, to answer that question, we need to rely on some new ideas in cellular, molecular, and developmental biology, along with some vocabulary terms and concepts. And so these are probably things that would be better introduced uh, later in the, uh, in the high school curriculum. Now, all these topics and many more are discussed in great detail with lots of references both from the popular and from the peer-reviewed literature in my book, Rethinking Evolution. And I hope that you'll visit my website, RethinkingEvolution.com, to learn more about the book. You'll find a glossary there that is hyperlinked to Wikipedia, so you can find quick excerpts from Wikipedia that define hundreds of different terms, and then you can also go to Wikipedia for a more in-depth explanation of any of those things so that it's a way for people who don't have a lot of background in biology to get quickly up to speed uh, if, as long as they're willing to put in just a little bit of effort to actually look these things up. You'll also find a press release at that site and you'll also find the publisher's book page which has the table of contents. Uh, there's way over 400 pages in this book but I've tried to make it as accessible as possible to general readers, which was uh, partly why it took me an entire year to write it. But I think that I've succeeded fairly well in providing a comprehensive view of various aspects of evolution that need to be incorporated into a broader updated synthesis, along with lots of new ideas uh, that haven't really been discussed before that I think um, actually provide a much more plausible explanation for the origins of evolutionary complexity. So I'd like to stop there and take a few questions uh, at this point.